Yeah, so welcome to the seventh talk in the series of functional programming, where we will be looking at the, um, well, we'll try and benefit from all the hard work we've done in talk six. And this talk will be a lot, a lot easier than talk six. So, um, uh, but I will have a, quite a few slides. So I'm going to rattle through them a little bit fast. If it goes too fast, then play it back on YouTube on, on slower speeds or something. So let's look at uh, this is the outline you've seen that before no. we're somewhere uh, we're somewhere around the advanced topics uh, inside there and zooming in on the advanced topics today's topics will be essentially be memorization and lazy types but what we're going to do is build on the lexical scopes that we had last time so later in a later talk we will look at using dynamic the dynamic scopes for, for other stuff so today is about the lexical scopes uh, that we had before, and then dynamic scopes, as I said, will be a future talk. And lexical scopes for all intents and purposes today will be about closures. So if we start with the Fibonacci numbers, uh, this is a function which calls the Fibonacci numbers um, recursively, just calls itself and says um, to calculate Fibonacci uh, the 10th Fibonacci number, you need to calculate the 9th and the 8th. And to calculate the 9th, you need the 8th and the 7th. And to, to calculate the 8th, you need the 7th and the 6th, and so forth. So what's also in there is a call count, which says how many times it's been called, so that we can learn how slow it is, uh, because we can see how many times it recursively calls itself. So we looked at recursion already in top one, I think, as the engine that will drive many of the, the functional patterns, the, the, the tool that we, we could use to structure our code. So I realize I'm calling increment here on call count um, just because it's easier. As an exercise, you might try and write this in a functional way and see what, what whether it makes a difference. But the purpose here is just to learn how often the Fibonacci function calls itself to try and calculate these values. And otherwise, what's in here is basically the mathematical formula that we, we've got for the value that has just been translated into Lisp code. And you can see um, the return value is said to be the, the actual Fibonacci number, as well as how many times the function had called itself. So the 19th Fibonacci number is 6765, and it, the function calls itself 13 and a half thousand times. Um, I should say I start counting from zero, where it's more conventional to start counting from one, but but um, for this particular talk today, I will start counting from zero. Okay, so that tells us how many times the function called itself. So now let's look at what the timing is. And to do this, we write a timing macro, which you can see here on the screen. If you have forgotten what the hashes do, then you can refer back to talk four. Basically, the hash number equals references a particular point in the code, and the hash colon start, or whatever, creates an uninterned symbol. And the hash three hash, for example, references the third equal, so the time variable. And the reason for doing this, for using uninterned symbols, is that uh, it will never conflict with anything that might be in the body of the, of what, whatever we're timing. So even if we use the, an uninterned symbol in the body macro with the same name, it will be a different symbol. So you can see this took um, the 30th Fibonacci number. It took about seven seconds to run on my slow laptop. So um, we, we'll try and see if we can make this go faster. But as far as functional programming is concerned, you might say, well, actually, it just returns the right value. So we don't really care about how long it takes to calculate this. But if we do care about the time it takes to calculate, so then one of the options is to remember what the values were. Because if you think about how the, the 10th Fibonacci number is calculated, we need the 9th and the 8th. The 9th needs the 8th and the 7th. The 7th needs the 6th and the 5th, and so on. So you, you get it all several times. So if we could remember what the 8th was once it has been calculated, because it will never change, because the Fibonacci function is a pure function, its value depends only on what we put in. So here, 
we build a cache, which in this case is a hash table. And you can see it wraps around the new Fibonacci function that I've defined here in a closure. So the cache sits in a closure. It has lexical scope, which means that it will live as long as the function lives. And it is accessible only inside of that function definition. And let's see how that works. So you can see, um, I call the Fibonacci function 1, 10, 20, 30. And you can see that the values it returns are actually the same as before, but the number of recursions is much, much smaller because it will say, oh, have I done this before? Then I'll just look it up in the hash table. And if I haven't done it before, then I will calculate it and, and actually go through the calculation of doing recursive stuff. So um, as an exercise, you might try and, and not use a hash table and use a vector instead, but, but the vector will have to grow because as you call it with higher and higher values, then the vector might need to extend itself to get longer and longer so you can accommodate those. So let's digress again slightly um, and look at the mathematical formula because now we've seen two implementations already of the Fibonacci function. One was the naive one where we just took the mathematical formula I've got here and implemented it in Lisp. So basically take the mathematical formula, translate it into Lisp code, and off we go. The, then we realize it's quite slow. So the next step is to try and memor, memorize the values that it returns, because then that speeds it up a bit. Because it's a pure function, the value will be the same every time. Now, um, let's do something cleverer, because what we're interested in is really just what the value is. We're not so much interested in the implementation as long as it's correct. So here's a bit of maths that shows the calculation behind um, as a sort of matrix form. And um, you can verify this by hand, it's quite easy. Um, you can see that there are um, eigenvectors with particular eigenvalues. And you can easily do a calculation. Uh, what we need is the power of this matrix because we're starting with the starting values. And then we keep multiplying with that matrix to get the next numbers in the sequence. And if we do that sufficiently many times, n times, we will get the nth Fibonacci number and the n plus one Fibonacci number. And if we have the diagonalization of the matrix, then we can just do it by raising the powers there because the first matrix and the last matrix are inverses of each other. So they will cancel each other out in, this, in the sandwich bits. But the crusts, they will remain because there's nothing to cancel them. So you can just sit down. If, if, you, if you're not into the maths, then don't worry too much about it. Just take, you can actually play with this formula. The upshot of it is that we get a closed form at the end. So this form directly gives us the nth Fibonacci value, where alpha and beta are defined constants that we had here before. Alpha is one plus root five over two and beta is one minus root five over two. So you can play the, with this on your calculator or in Emacs. Um, so this is called a closed form because it doesn't depend on any summation and stuff. We can just plug um, an n in and out will pop the Fibonacci values that we're interested in. So here's that done in Emacs. You can see we'd use defconst to, to define the constants. And we define the fractional values as well, uh, where we divide by um, the, the length of the vectors, the eigenvectors. And finally, we implement the Fibonacci function, which is now much, much shorter. Um, it is just essentially doing one side of the calculation and the other side of the calculation and adding them together. And then testing it, we see that the 10th Fibonacci number is 89.0000, blah, 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 three. And the 100th Fibonacci number, it will cheerfully give as, as some value like that. So suddenly it's super, super fast. It returns the same values as before, but now the really, really slow recursion that we had is super, super fast because we have done the extra bit of maths to get a closed form and the result just pops straight out. Right? There's, nothing, there's no work to do, essentially. We can even improve it a little bit by, well, 
one little niggle here is that you get rounding errors because we're working with real numbers. So the niggle here is you might take the Fibonacci number of one and say, well, actually it's not 0 0.9999, it is one. So let's round it to one. And the 19th Fibonacci number is not 6765 point something. It is an integer. It has to be an integer that pops out. So we could actually just round it to the nearest integer. But we can do even better because the absolute value of beta is less than, less than one because it was one minus root five over two, which is minus 0 0.68 something something. So uh, we can actually just, just implement the Fibonacci functions like this. We take the alpha part of the formula and we just round to the nearest integer. And you can see when, when we test it, it actually works a treat. We take the zeroth, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and they actually come out, out exactly right as we expected. So suddenly we've done a bit of maths, we've done a bit of computing, and, and we have a super, super, super fast Fibonacci function where we started with the, the naive implementation in, in, by just translating the, the recursive formula into Lisp, which works, but it's slow. And now we have something that works and is super, super fast. So the point I want to emphasize here is when we do functional programming and we, do, we have pure functions, then we are just interested in the value that pops out. So you could say from a theoretical point of view, we don't really care as long as the function returns the right value, we don't really care how it got there. But of course, in practice, you are interested in having the correct value, but also having it delivered fairly quickly so that you don't have to wait too long for Emacs to, to do its calculations. So as a theorist, you will say, well, we don't really care how it got there, but as a practical functional programmer, you will want to have the faster implementation. Um, one other thing to bear in mind, there's an exercise in here to, to try and, and find out whether there are actually any differences here between the two implementations. So if you pop in a zero, a one, a two, a three, a four, it will return the zeroth Fibonacci value, the first, the second, the and so on. So you would say, well, actually, they are the same function because any valid input I put in, they will return the same output. So as an exercise, I want you to try and think about whether there are any differences in, in, in the real world and what they are. Obviously, other than the first one being much, 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 much faster than the second one. The other thing to bear in mind is the memorization, the, the caching the values in there that, um, uh, that we looked at. Because we use the cache to remember the function values. So eventually the cache becomes the function because the, the values of the function are stored in the cache. The next thing we're gonna look at is caching values in a sequence. So we're gonna look at uh, generators that evaluate lazily. So let's imagine we have an infinite sequence when which in this case is just 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, everybody's favorite um, powers of two sequence. And to build that, we will use an initial value that we start with and a step, which is the function. So the function introduced here is a generator generator, if you like. It takes the initial value and it takes a step function and it returns a function in this lambda that calls the step function on whatever value it is at at the particular time and it remembers that value in it in a closure. So this is a little bit different from before. Before we had a closure that cached all the function values. Now we have a sequence of values, but we only remember where we currently are in the sequence. We just, we don't remember all of them. We just remember the current step in the sequence. And then as we keep calling this function, then it just moves along the sequence 
to, in this case, higher and higher powers of two. So this is a very general generator and we can sort of get away with calling it lazy evaluation because it's an infinite sequence, but we don't get the next value until we call the generator and say, give me the next value. So we'll now look at that a little bit. And, and again, we're using the closure to remember where we are in the sequence. Here's a similar thing that's, that's using a list as an input. And again, it returns a function that just gives us the next value in that list. But the, the, the interesting thing about it is that when we get to the end of the list, we loop around and start over again. So we get again an infinite sequence from a finite list. So here, starting with the list of just one, two, three, uh, we get a function out of it, which you can see Emacs calls a closure because it's a function with them. And, and it's, got a, it's inside of a closure that has the, um, the current value cached inside it. And you can see it just loops through the sequence, uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, forever. So we generate an infinite sequence and you can actually see how I've done it up here because it takes the list as an input and it copies that list in case we, we, we're not supposed to modify a list that we're given in case I used it for something else as well, it would be rude to modify it. And then I just link the last CDR of the list that normally is a, is a nil back to the beginning of the list. So the list now is a set of const cells that loop around forever. And all the Lambda does is just to step to the next element in the list. And it doesn't have to check for the end of the list because the list has no end. The list is circular. So with this tool, I can now have, again, it returns a function that I can keep calling as a sequence and it just gives me the next element of the list. So now we can return to FizzBuzz, which was, um, I can't remember which talk we did it in, but we, we have looked at FizzBuzz a, a couple of times. If you don't remember, the, if you have a number divisible by three, you, you say Fizz. If you have a number divisible by five, you say Buzz. If you have a number divisible by both three and five, you say FizzBuzz. And if you have a number divisible by neither three nor five, you just return the number. So here I have constructed that as a sequence. And the, the sequence is built on, out of three distinct separate sequences. The first sequence counts the numbers that are divisible by three and returns a fizz if, if they are divisible by three. It actually doesn't check whether the number is divisible by three. It just relies on being nil, nil, fizz, nil, nil, fizz, nil, nil, fizz consecutively. And buzz similar counts the fives and the number just generates the numbers like we saw before. It's just an infinite sequence starting at one and keeping adding one every, in every call. And you can see there's a tiny tidy up function call here, uh, which calls fizz, it calls buzz and it calls number. So it steps each of the three sequences in parallel and then it combines the value of that into a single value that is returned from the main sequence. So you can sort of imagine uh, three sequences aligned next to each other and there's a function call that returns uh, a sort of calculated sequence out of the values we have from these three smaller sequences. And you can see the tidy up function here, all it does is to say, if I have a fizz value and a buzz value, together, then I need to say both fizz and buzz. If not, I will say fizz if it's there, I'll say buzz if it's there, and otherwise I'll just say the number, whatever the number was. So the tidy up function is quite, kind of small and, and clean. And you can see how it works. Um, I will uh, let you be the fizz buzz um, function that I can keep calling. And V is just a vector that I will fill values into. And you can see how it, um, or, or, or basically, um, just to give me a finite number, right? Because it's an infinite sequence and um, I haven't got room for an infinite sequence. So I will 
just say, give me 30 values or something like that. So the, the vector here is just used to give me a, a finite number of that sequence so we can see whether it works or not. And you will see this pattern throughout the rest of the, this talk that um, with infinite sequences, we need to somehow truncate them to, to see whether, well, to get something we can manage without running out of memory or something. And you can see it appears to work. One, two, fizz, four, buzz. So three becomes fizz, five becomes buzz. And if it extended to 15, you would see it become it becomes fizz buzz. So basically, again, it's a sequence. And every time we call the function, the sequence function, which is called u in this case, we will step the sequence and get the next value. So u, 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 every time we call, we get the next value in that sequence. So and that's kind of a way to manage infinite sequences and just calculate the numbers that we, we want but it has no memory. It only remembers the step where we happen to be at that time. If we wanted to have that memory of where we are in the sequence, like we did with the cache before in the first part of the talk, where we said this cache builds up, it remembers all of our Fibonacci values so that we can keep referring back to them. So the next question we're gonna ask ourselves is, can we build a sequence generator that has a memory it remembers its previous values? And here's a really kind of simple example of one. Um, we, we're sort of just starting with an initial value, which could be zero and a step function as before with a list generator. The difference is where the list generator function that we had before, or this, this um, simple generator it was called, where that just remembers where it is at any given time, we will now build the values of the sequence into that list. And again, we call a function that will step that sequence. And you can see um, approximately how it works. It just replaces the end of the sequence. So it just keeps building stuff at the end. And um, the function call is on the value towards the end of the sequence. And it just says, um, well, call this and then build it together. And you can actually sit down and work out how it works. So you can see as an example, if we start with a sequence that has an in initial value of zero and it has a step function of one, then we call the step function three times. And you can see it's built a one, a two and a three. And then it has the, the function call at the end. And the point is that every time you call pipe step, it just gets longer and longer and longer and longer. And uh, you can build this sequence as often, as much as you like. Um, and it's an infinite sequence and it remembers all the values that it has generated. So it's not possibly not the most efficient and you can find pipes out there that are better designed. And again, this is kind of a pattern is in this talk. We are implementing code in ways that are not necessarily the best because we start thinking about functional programming and generating sequences and stuff. And then we implement something that's a hack. And then we think about it later and say, oh, actually we could make it better by doing something and something. So um, one of the exercises you might want to think about in this regard is, could you make this simple thing, the simple pipe sequence generator, could you make that more efficient than uh, the one I've implemented here. So by, by looking at the complexity, because last, as we build a sequence and it has 100,000 elements in it, last will still have to step all the way through that sequence to get to the end so it can add stuff at the end of the sequence. So you might say, well, that's probably a little bit inefficient and it might be better to add stuff at the beginning. But I'll leave you to think about it and we'll have the answers perhaps in the next talk. So what might we do with one of these? The classic example is generating primes. And again, this is far from being the most efficient implementation of this because we, again, we are starting inefficiently and just hacking stuff to get our heads around what we're trying to do. So um, suppose we wanted to find prime numbers in a sequence because then we have to remember all the previous values. So we can use 
um, trial division and try and divide the candidate prime with all the known primes that are smaller than it and to see whether it is actually a prime or not. So here's a sort of an example in uh, Python. And again, this is far from being efficient code because it's just essentially a trial division, which is one of the worst ways perhaps of generating prime numbers because it's quite inefficient. And, and we shall see later how to make it efficient. But it's just to illustrate the principle of how the values are being generated in an infinite sequence. Because as we know, there are infinitely many primes. Or, well, if not, we'll run the code for a long time and see if, if it ever stops. So you can see it starts by generating two, it generates three, it then generates five, and then it just steps past the values divisible by three. So it goes to seven, then it adds four to get to 11, it adds two to get to 13, four to get to 17, two to get 19, and so on. And it does a, a, a little is prime test by doing pro trial division with all the, by all the primes that we have found so far. So um, we can see a little bit of code that, that actually calls this function. We generate 30,000 primes and we, we actually don't care about the value. We're just interested in how long it takes to run this code. And again, the code is not efficient, but that is not what we care about yet. We will get to efficiency later. What we do care about is the generator, the thing that Python calls a generator as well, that you keep calling it and saying, give me the next value, give me the next value, give me the next value. So um, we will do it twice again. We will do it in common list and we will do it in Emacs list because those are quite different. So I'll just go through each one in turn. Common Lisp doesn't have a yield because it doesn't need one. So here's an example of how I actually implement one using the, the system that is already there. So I define a condition called yield and I call it like this. So this function is, uh, well, it returns a lambda, it returns a function that I can keep calling and it will keep generating prime numbers. It remembers the primes inside our closure, the lexically scoped prime variable. And it remembers this condition that it uses to essentially return the value to the caller. And you can sort of think of it a bit like an exception, as a kind of sophisticated exception, but it remembers where it came from. So it can return, it can go back into um, this lambda and continue the calculation to get the next value out of it. So you can see an, a number is a prime if there's a, the flat defines a local function, if there's no divisor um, that gives us the value zero on trial division of um, the candidate prime with the particular divisor we look at and the divisors look loop over all the primes we have found so far. So again, this is quite a functional way of doing it. And uh, you can see we do the same thing as before. Two is a prime, three is a prime, five is a prime. And so are the values stepping two and four across uh, to, to skip the ones that are divisible by three. And again, we have the, the, the timing of, of doing that. Um, here I use the time function, which is built into common Lisp, so we don't need the timing macro from before. And we just essentially catch the, the yield condition when it's um, quote unquote thrown by the generator. And we, we let it loop 30,000 times and um, just essentially we throw the values away, but we're interested in how long it takes for it to run. Now, interestingly, Emacs has a yield as well. So if you say require generator, you get it loaded into Emacs. You have to define your function slightly differently uh, with the iter defun. And here's the, our prime generator. And again, it does the yield, yielding two, three, five, exactly the same as before. A number is a prime if it's not divisible by any of the things we've seen before. Uh, this bit at the end of the screen says prime uh, primes. Um, so this is the primes value. And it does exactly the same stuff as before. Whenever we find a prime, 
yield it and then push it onto the primes list and go back into the loop and, and generate more stuff next time we we loop around. And here's how it's called. Uh, so here we have to call the iter next on the on the lambda just to make sure we go back into this, to it and get the next value out of it. And we use a, a timing macro to generate them as many primes as we want. And we try to generate 30,000 or something. And here's how it works. So generating 10,000 primes, 30,000 primes, 50,000 and 100,000 primes. And you can see what the actual prime is that it generates. And you can see how long it took for Python to run it, for common Lisp to run it, and for Emacs Lisp to run it. And you can see Python is actually doing pretty well. It's only about twice the runtime of common Lisp. So that's not too bad. Emacs, on the other, other hand, is quite slow. So you probably wouldn't want to go higher than 30,000 primes for this kind of thing. But remember that the code is not efficient because we're doing trial division and we're doing trial division all the way up to the prime that we is our candidate prime. So, um, so if, for the really keen uh, person, you might want to just, just improve the code a bit to make it easier to, to only test trial divisions up to the root of P, the square root of P, and uh, to maybe take the, the smaller primes, uh, which are more likely to be devices uh, towards the front of your um, of your candidates, your devices, and, and so on. So you can easily make it faster if you like. But the comparison here is just to look at the uh, what we're interested in today is not generating the primes in, in general. It is the tools that we have available to generate sequences, infinite sequences in Lisp, in functional programming in Lisp. So um, here's a slight, another slight digression. Um, here's the Haskell version that comes out of a, a paper by O'Neill and uh, it's quite short. And translating that directly into Lisp, we get something like this. It's a, a sieve and it constructs, the, the colon here is essentially what we call cons. So it takes a prime and consists it onto a, a list and the square brackets is list, list comprehension, which is essentially what we call loop because loop is used to build a list of things that satisfy certain criteria. And translating this code, directly, literally into Lisp makes it look like this. So it's a little bit longer, but it does the same thing, except in practice, it will run out of stack when you try to run it because uh, it's not tail recursion optimizable. And it also needs to have an infinite list of integers as input, but in principle, it works. And this is just another way of, of looking at um, generating an infinite sequence. So you sort of have an infinite sequence put in and you have an infinite sequence that in principle comes out, except we'll run out of stack at some point. So this is again, not very practical code, but today we're just interested in, in the tools that generate those sequences. So we have looked at different methods because I started this talk by looking at closures for holding the information about either all the values that we have generated or in an infinite sequence where we are currently in the sequence. And holding those in a closure, um, I would typically create a closure like in the second bit here and then return a lambda that references that closure to remember what the state is, whether it is all the values generated for the function or so far or whether it is the current state of the sequence, the closure is used to remember where we are. And every time I call the Lambda, it will update its closure to say, here's a new value that I found, or here's the next step in the sequence. In the case of the iterator, the yield, you might ask, so it's doing the same thing essentially, but where's that state, where's it held? And we will return to that actually in a later talk, but you can sort of think of it as being held in the stack uh, because it returns that value to, to you with yield, uh, 
And when you return from that, then it goes back to where it was, where it came from, and continues from there. So the, the information about what is there, the local variables that are visible at that point, and where you are in the code in the execution of the, the Lambda is remembered by Lisp itself. It's on the stack. So um, um, which you choose is, is essentially a matter of preference. I like the second one because it's very Lispy to have these closures. But, um, but the iterator thing is available to you as well. If you come from the Python world, you might prefer the iterator. So I'm just gonna talk about another kind of lazy evaluation called series, which I think do not exist for Emacs and would probably be hard to translate into Emacs, although there might have been people out there who have tried. So I will just co go through it fairly briefly as a sort of example of more sophisticated sequences that you can generate. A series has got, um, functions to generate series, functions to process series, like we did with FizzBuzz, taking three different series and combining them into a single one by, by just processing the values that they generate. We'll see in a moment what that looks like again. And it has functions to collect values out of those series as well. So it could be counting the length, counting the, uh, multiplying them together is in this case or, or, or something different. So this factorial says, um, give me the range from one up to K and then essentially collect that as a series, a finite series into a single product, which returns a value that I can then return from the function, which is the factorial. The interesting thing about series is that they are kind of more fundamental types because in my previous series with the pipes and the the, the generators that we had before, I had to call a function to get the next value. With yield, I had to say next or something to get the next value. With series, they will cheerfully plow ahead without stopping until unless you stop them. So you have to be very careful with series because just printing them on the screen um, will, or, or in the debugger, just trying to print them can cause an infinite series to try and print itself. And if you're in slime, um, for example, in Emacs, then you'll run out of buffer at some point because you generate millions of things. And if you are in an, an X term or, or some terminal, then it will probably just print numbers, bigger and bigger numbers forever. So here's a, an example of what the Fibonacci numbers look like. So this works exactly like the matrix we had before, where you start a value one and zero here as the initial values. And here we have two series that are stepped in parallel. And the value that we're looking at is um, the an and an plus one um, sort of stepping in, in parallel. So as you step that, you get the an plus one becomes the next an. And then it gets uh, the next value becomes then a n plus two becomes the next a n plus one, if that makes sense. And you can see it's it's basically generated here. You you add for um, for the higher values, and then you remember the next higher value, and then you just step those. So the function starts with initial values, and it has a lambda that said tells it how to step. So this is exactly like the pipe we had before, or rather like the simple generator we had before. It has an initial value and it has a function to call in each step. The difference is that the, the series is truly lazy in the sense that it, it doesn't evaluate anything until we call it. But once, it, once you call it, it will evaluate everything and just trying to print it will evaluate everything because the printer tries to evaluate what the series is so that it can display it on your screen. So again, here's an example of the Fibonacci series that um, again, I, just to test it, just to show it what, what it looks like, I have to say, well, give me a 20 element series and truncate the first one. So it has the same length at the second one. 
co-truncate will just truncate a series to, to give me whatever the length is of the shorter one. And since the, the first one is infinite and the second one has like 20, then we'll just get the first 20 Fibonacci numbers. And you can see it works perfectly well. And um, it, it's just that I have to be careful when I print it out because I'm, I'm, I only have finite much um, finite screen space. So here's FizzBuzz and it works exactly like before. I have a series that generates nil nil fizz, nil nil fizz, nil nil fizz forever, like my uh, list generator that I had before. And the same thing with buzz. And the integer goes from one with no upper limit. So again, it's an infinite series. And I have the tidy up function in here that, that says if I have both fizz and buzz, then return fizz buzz. And if not, then return either fizz or buzz or n, whichever is available and not nil. And you can see once again, I use code truncate to, to limit the output. And you can see that it generates a, a sequence. The hash z is uh, a shorthand reader macro notation for a series. And you can see it works perfectly well. Whoops. Uh, on 15, it gives me fizzbuzz, and on 30, it gives me fizzbuzz, and otherwise, it gives me fizzes and buzzes or numbers. And the second series that comes out here is just the, the side effect of having the co truncate that it truncates the second series as well. Well, because it's finite, it will be the, the shorter one. If you actually use the value from this output, then it will ignore the second value and just use the first one. So we're actually wrapping up now. Um, so what I've tried to show you today is how to use closures in functional programming. And we've seen three different use cases, more or less. One is a pure function that always gives you the same value. And we can use the cache to, uh, in a, inside of a closure to try and generate more and more values and remember what they were. And we can use that to make it go faster, particularly if it's a recursive function. Um, we like the recursion because it's it's nice and easy because uh, it's a very natural way to express a functional programming type of things. You do things recursively, split them into smaller problems, and then put the values together somewhere at the end. But in practice, that can be quite slow if it's doing lots of recursion. So the caching can actually be a, a very useful tool without actually compromising on the pure function, the, the functional programming that you actually want to do. It just makes it go faster. And in, a, in, in some theoretical sense, the cache that is eventually built up inside of your closure becomes the function. If you think of the hash table we had before, it has a mapping from a key to a value, and that key value mapping is exactly the function mapping of all the values that we have seen until now. The second case we looked at is a sequence where we just step every time an infinite sequence and we call something and it goes step, 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 whether it's a, a, a powers of two or we step through a list or we do fizzbuzz or, so, or some such, or, or there um, could be Fibonacci numbers as well in principle. Um, and the cache, or, or rather the closure, is used just to remember where we are in that sequence. And we also had the other version of sequences, which are called pipes in Lisp, where we had a, a somewhat inefficient uh, implementation, what it'll do for now, that looked at remembering all the values that was generated by the sequence so far, and then we can step it as many times as we like to generate as many values as we like. Because again, it's an infinite sequence, but it, re it remembers the values we have so far. So we can use that to generate the primes or, or whatever else we need. And there, again, there are some obvious exercises for people to make it, make it better. Because the, uh, deliberately, I have just introduced some, some proof of concept work that just shows you roughly how it works. And then once we have that, we can build on that to make it better and to, to make it a better design. So in a, in a functional term, you, you could say, well, actually, it remembers where it is in the sequence. But you can think of it as 
a function that is called on itself multiple times. So you have the initial value x naught, and then you call the step function on that value, you get the next value. You call the step function again, and you get the on whatever came out of the previous one, and you call it again and again and again, and you generate an infinite sequence that way. Or at least you generate as many values as you want in your sequence. So from a functional programming perspective, you just get a sequence call by calling f on itself iteratively again and again and again. And to, to, to step the value in the pipe or in the sequence to give you that, that value. And you, you saw that you could do that with yield, and you can do that with the value being held in a closure that um, I prefer the, the latter. But if you come from Python, you might prefer the former. Who knows? And um, that is it for today. We have seen how to use closures in functional programming. Now go and solve the exercises, and we'll look at the answers next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>